All right. Good evening, Mayor Council. It's good to uh, see you all again. Uh, tonight, I will be primarily focusing on our quarterly statistics, which there's a memo that, you know, has all of the same information uh, that was distributed uh, last month, uh, mainly because I just presented over my program updates during the budget work session. So um, I thought I'd just stick to the numbers and see if y'all have any questions or direction that you may have for uh, me or, more st or my staff. Uh, again, this is third quarter. There's a number of trends that we are continue to see as well as forecasting that I'll go over. Uh, and again, uh, be soliciting any type of information or questions uh, from council. Let's see. For the third quarter, our activities uh, have been fairly consistent. Uh, and mainly we are seeing uh, some of the same trending information. Uh, the less number of precipitation as far as that we've seen uh, as compared to last year's had an impact on our numbers. Uh, but we're also seeing a high level of uh, compliance out in the community, uh, which is promising. Uh, during this third quarter, I'll speak to it a little bit more. We've had some staff changes. Uh, however, even through, through uh, the less precipitation and some staffing changes, we still see a decline in complaints that are submitted from residents. Uh, we also have seen a reduction as far as properties contracted uh, by staff, and which, is, uh, which uh, is really in part due to compliance from residents. Uh, and we do continue to see a high level as far as an increase in citations issued uh, by our staff. And again, uh, we look at each code case uh, independently from one another, and we look to see what tool, as far as enforcement goes, to see which is best applicable. Uh, sometimes it it's, might be uh, more favorable to issue a citation versus contracting. So uh, along with our field supervisor and myself, we work with staff to make sure that we're using the most aggressive tool. Sometimes it's both of those. Uh, but again, uh, we do see, uh, as far as a higher number of citations that we're uh, issuing as far as in um, out in the residential areas. This is a visual representation of uh, what each month looks like. Uh, as you can see, uh, April, uh, we did have some uh, a higher disparity between what we did between this quarter and last quarter. Then for May and June, we stabilized it as far as the proactive uh, code goes. Uh, and again, there's a number of factors that probably feed into that uh, that I can go into uh, a little bit more detail. But mainly uh, in April, you know, we did see a higher instance of uh, or less rain than we did the previous uh, year, which had the biggest impact. Uh, the subsequent months, again, uh, we work with staff to make sure that we were trying to at least stay in, in trend with uh, our previous year comparisons. Again, complaints, which is I, I'm happy to report, we still see a decline as far as uh, complaints that are submitted by residents. And this is uh, through all avenues. Uh, this is phone uh, where residents can call in and report those. It's web complaints, and it's also a number of walk-ins uh, that we all track. So we have a number of ways that we gather uh, that we gather complaints from the public, and uh, it's good to see that we continue to see a trend downward as far as complaints go. Now, when you look at the year-to-date comparisons, uh, again, there's a number of things that impact us. You see <laughs> the violations identified pro proactively. There's a bigger uh, distance between what we did last year and this year. Uh, what plays into this is uh, we've had a staff changeover of three code officers. Uh, decided to um, either go to other communities or I've had changed professions. So we've had a number of staff, uh, the, at least those three have been replaced. Uh, our next quarter should actually be a little bit uh, better as uh, they started. We had two that started on July 23rd and another one that started in August uh, 13th. So uh, again, that, that should help tighten up as far as proactively identifying some code violations, uh, some of those areas. Uh, predominantly, the southern part of Mesquite is where two of our code officers uh, actually, uh, where we had our, our uh, vacancies. And so the southern part, I've been watching those numbers for this quarter and uh, we're seeing a, a surge or a higher number of instances of uh, proactive code going on uh, but finding especially when we 
we lose one staff member, it's easy to keep up, but when you have three, uh, there are some areas that uh, we're just not able to perform or provide the same level of code enforcement, uh, unfortunately. So being fully staffed, uh, we're getting them trained up, uh, and uh, they are coming along. They're very enthusiastic, and a number of them are already issuing citations. And uh, one thing to note, when a code officer that is not licensed by the state, if they issue a citation, we have to have them sign as a witness, and we have a licensed code officer sign. So uh, two code officers actually issue uh, or are part of that one citation, so that also they get practice in going through the court process and what it takes to document it properly, how to obtain a warrant, and those types of things. So while they're getting fully trained, we are still issuing citations. Uh, it probably won't be the same levels as we've seen uh, in previous quarters, uh, but the proactive identification of code violations, we should see an increase in those during the fourth quarter. So you can see our year-to-date complaints as far as submitted by residents. Uh, we, we have seen an overall decline for the year. Uh, as well as properties contracted. Uh, and again, you can see we, we, while we had our, all of our staff licensed and issuing citations, uh, we had a, a rather large increase over what we did last year. So uh, I'll, I have a slide specifically over citations I'll go over uh, here in a moment. Uh, but just so you can see, uh, staff is continuing to be aggressive throughout the community. Let's see if I can get that. As far as our new benchmarking data that we um, are starting to, uh, to, to, to really track is uh, the number of days or the average that it takes for code officer to work a case, and this is from open to close, uh, and we continue to see a uh, decline in the amount of time that it takes. So um, this will improve as well. I, I anticipate uh, to see a, a trend downward on this one, especially since uh, new staff comes on. They're being more proactive and, and especially more eager to open and close cases now that we know that uh, that we're tracking this as, a, as an item. Uh, so overall, 23 is our year-to-date number. Our goal, again, that we started at the beginning of the year was uh, 30 days. So uh, we'll be evaluating this probably going into October to see if maybe we need to make this a more uh, aggressive number so that we can have staff uh, kind of keeping that in mind when they're out there working. Methods of, of compliance, uh, again, we are seeing about an 84% voluntary compliance, which is still high. Uh, it's a bit of a downtick from what we saw last quarter, uh, but then again, I, I would consider anything over 80% really good. Uh, this is when residents are um, receiving our notice of violations and re resolving the issue on their own, and that's obviously what we want to see. We want to educate and then also work with our residents to obtain compliance. For residents having some type of a hardship, whether it be financial or maybe a physical hardship, uh, we have the home program which we are, uh, that we're referring them to, uh, as well as we're, we always, our staff gives um, extensions if need be. Uh, the key is uh, we ask residents to contact us uh, a lot of times uh, maybe when uh, we get uh, feedback from the from the public, it's sometimes that they haven't reached out to their code officer, at least the ones that I've spoken to. So uh, we continue to work and educate our, our public to reach out to us so that uh, if they are experiencing some type of hardship, just reach out to us. Our, our staff is, uh, is aggressive yet compassionate. We take every, again, every case is held on its own. Please, please go right ahead. Brandon, if, if I can interrupt you just for a minute. Sure. And, and, and a great presentation so far. And thankful for what your guys and gals do every day out there. Uh, there's been tremendous improvement in the last few years uh, in our overall blight situation. Um, you touched on something I've been a little bit concerned about here lately. And, and I get a lot of requests and, and concerns from residents whose you know, parents or grandparents are in a really tough spot. Uh, physically, they can't do the work, or financially, they're not able to get the, the supplies necessary to do the work, um, or multiple scenarios. And of course, there's times where they probably could, and, and we filled through those pretty good, I think. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll preface by saying, you know, I've said many times, government can't and shouldn't do everything for everybody. But with those number of folks growing, and given the fact that we do have a larger senior community, um, here lately I've had a couple of folks have said that, you know, I guess addressing Mesquite Bay was already full up um, and for whatever reason 
uh, I guess they didn't necessarily uh, qualify for the home program or, or the rehab. And I just wanted to know, you know, what are your thoughts about that, which you, you've already touched on, and, and how, how are funds doing for home and rehab in terms of if future needs that may come up here in the next few months? Sure. So that's a great question. What we're doing is, uh, as far as home goes, we are really relying on this time of year on volunteers. Um, and when we switch to that mode, it, it really has to be, be within the scope of what a volunteer can do. Uh, and I understand, I, I already know of two instances where um, either uh, at addressing Mesquite Day applicant uh, after we've gone out and looked at the property or somebody that's applied for our emergency repair uh, for uh, our community development block grant, uh, what we're seeing is that some of these properties are in such disrepair that it's outside of the scope of all the volunteer and just the money, uh, the, the monetary amount is such that it's going to take an extensive overhaul. So what we're trying to do is, one, utilize our, our CDBG um, funds as far as for some of those larger projects because there's a larger threshold that we can fund uh, with the grant program. Uh, the drawback is is that you know there there is a wait list so we have to work with residents. Our staff it's not so much processing uh, that wait list. I, I think that even if they're sitting there um, in queue uh, we're doing all what we can to gather the necessary documents so as soon as funding is released or available that we can move on to it so we're looking at uh, and I've been working with Mr. Kahili and with Ms. Bradley on increasing our capacity there which uh, is definitely a goal going into this next year so I'm happy to report that that's something that we're trying to be proactive on uh, to address maybe finding some solutions uh, now, this time of year, we are focused on addressing Mesquite Day as far as our fundraising efforts go. Uh, probably after addressing Mesquite Day, we will be uh, working with our community, uh, trying to solicit some volunteers, uh, a pool of volunteers, as well as additional donations for the home program. Uh, that one, we don't have a large pool of money at this time, at this time of year, because we've done a number of projects over the summer. Uh, but we are working and we have a plan to switch gears after addressing Mesquite Day uh, to look at increasing the capacity for that program. And Yolanda is really aggressive as far as that's concerned. She's really creative. As a matter of fact, she's worked with volunteers where if there's a, uh, uh, a senior uh, resident that may not be able to maintain their yard, she's actually found volunteers that go out there every two to three weeks, kind of an adopt a lawn type process uh, to really help maintain those to minimum standard. Now when it comes to the larger repairs, uh, that's one where we're still working on finding some creative approaches uh, with the resources that we have. I was just going to say, um, there, from time to time, I, I have to be creative and try to get some volunteers together for different folks out there with their, their struggles that, that, that couldn't go through our system. Uh, I was going to ask you, and, and sometimes it works out great. Uh, maybe there's some firefighters or some different groups that are available, and sometimes it just doesn't. You just want to you want to cry for those folks. I was going to ask you, how does it generally going for you when you don't have the resources or the ability to get them in home or rehab in terms of finding volunteers? I was just curious. Well, we actually uh, we have made. Con I'll give you a, a good example. Is uh, we have a a really. Um, robust and, and really busy Home Depot here in our community, uh, but there's been another project where the Richardson Home Depot has reached out and, and really interested in, in working with a property here in Mesquite. So we are trying to use every tool at our disposal as well as there's a, off the top of my head, there's a credit union that actually has a, uh, a, a fund mechanism that's similar to um, home as far as that they provide some funds for some qualified um, residents if, if they meet certain thresholds. So all of this is are things that, that Yolanda keeps in a database and if she comes across a resident, um, whether she knows about another uh, avenue, uh, she's trying to get them plugged up as best as possible. Thanks for letting me interrupt you. Thank you. Oh, no, no problem. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so again, uh, just looking at overall compliance, uh, a rather, when you look at the bigger picture, 3% uh, citations and 13 are going to our abatement um, contractor. 
As far as citations go, and again, I, I'm reporting on numbers from, from the April through June timeframe, so these numbers may look a little bit different based on if I ran them today, uh, but based on what our citations uh, statuses look like, uh, we have about 29% that are, as, as far as in some in state, and we actually are working with our uh, marshal's office to make contact with those residents. So if we don't hear anything uh, within, an, within a couple week time frame, uh, we're being aggressive in making contact, making sure that they uh, set a court date so that we can uh, resolve the issue. Uh, out of those 13 in progress, that's if a court date has been set, looks like that, uh, that that they're working with us as far as there's a number of different categories that fit into in progress uh, but it's something is in the works um, as far as code docket goes again that's something that uh, that they've actually have scheduled something but maybe hasn't gone in front of our prosecutors uh, case close resolve 22 percent uh, that's where uh, some type of outcome has been made by our prosecutors or, or municipal court judge uh, the 14 percent dismissed by prosecutor it's a slight increase as far as 14 percent goes uh, there's a number of contributing factors one is that one of our staff members uh, that uh, uh, that decided to to move to south texas uh, she was one of our workhorses, and, uh, if you will, and she issued a number of citations. It's difficult to prosecute those, uh, those cases when the code officer is no longer with the city. Uh, and that, that is a drawback that we've learned uh, through the process of uh, losing three staff members uh, in the last quarter that, uh, that this may take a hit. Uh, now, it's not, that we're not, it's not that we're being lenient. I think our prosecutorial staff is, is actually still being very aggressive, uh, but sometimes there's just some circumstances that impact uh, what they're able to do and prosecute. Is there any questions as far as this one's concerned? Okay. As far as just if you're curious, uh, we broke down our top four violations. Again, uh, you can see that out of the top four, three are vegetative. Uh, so that's where I, I point out that when you have less precipitation, uh, you're going to have less of these numbers because it doesn't matter if it's a, on a, a little bit on the drier side or if we have a monsoon of a spring, uh, these three violations usually always end up in the top four or five. Uh, trash, junk, and debris, this could be a number of things, uh, uh, but this is mainly property cleanups where there's either improper placement or uh, if there's just loose trash, for instance, on the property. So uh, this continues to be one that's in our top four um, code violations. This just breaks it down for visually as far as each one of those top four, exactly how it breaks out as far as uh, compliance uh, goes. Uh, overhanging limbs in high grass and that vegetative. Uh, so anything that has to do with uh, the vegetative um, um, violations, you can see that we have a high level of compliance. Uh, trash, junk, and debris, that's one that we usually contract a little bit more. Uh, either uh, we come across a property and it's just not cleaned up to the standards, the minimum standards of the city, and we have to contract those. Uh, those usually we see a higher instance as far as contracting goes. As far as code ambassador statistics, uh, there are about their compliance rate, a little bit less. Uh, again, our code officers are about 83%, uh, but the compliance rate for code ambassadors is 40%. But I like to always point out that it's not because of the lack of them identifying uh, code violations. It's because our staff has a little bit more time to work a case from start to finish. A code ambassador essentially they identify code violation and 10 days later they do their reinspection. So they, they have a shorter amount of time as far as that they work for compliance. Uh, and then it's passed on to code staff. After they do the reinspection, it's, it's found to be in violation. Uh, that's when it's passed on to our professional staff. So usually we would anticipate that the numbers would not be as high as paid staff, but uh, we do have a, a great pool of volunteers that go out and volunteer uh, their own time. Uh, this upcoming year, uh, we weren't able to get uh, a, a code ambassador class scheduled for the fall. Uh, rather, what we're going to be doing is having a class earlier, kind of June, uh, or I'm sorry, January, February rather, 
and then have another one next fall. So we'll, we'll do the two classes this year. Just having the shortage of staff, we just weren't able to pull everything together to, uh, to have that class this fall that we were anticipating. But again, we, we have a great dedicated pool of staff, uh, or volunteers rather, that really go out and, and try to do good for their community. So we appreciate everything that they do. As far as uh, vacant properties go, we do, uh, this is a living database, and you've heard me say that before, uh, property switches hands, and uh, sometimes it goes vacant. Uh, maybe a resident just a isn't able to maintain the property, there's been a death in the family, and it's uh, in some type of a probate uh, status, or just for whatever reason, abandoned. Uh, so this number throughout the year will always change. As far as properties that are on automatic uh, maintenance, I believe at the time of the end of this quarter, we had 78 that were on an automatic maintenance program. Uh, this upcoming uh, quarter, you're gonna see that number probably uh, surpass 90. Uh, so our staff is being aggressive and um, I've talked to Mr. Kahili about this. We rarely, uh, not saying that we don't, uh, but the number of, of complaints that we've received over vacant tracts of land, we've seen a decline in those specifically. It's mainly because this type of a program, we have a contractor going out and maintaining those, especially after a property owner has uh, been deemed to not appropriately take care of that property. So uh, again, I, I like to credit this program as, uh, as, as staff getting together to try to find a creative solution uh, so that you all also don't receive those same complaints that we were getting, uh, especially on vacant tracts of land. That's uh, the conclusion. Since uh, again, I wanted to focus mainly on the numbers since you got a program update. Were there any questions or feedback that council has for? Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Rebus. Uh, no, the only question I have for you is uh, initially when we had started, uh, I think it was about two or three budget cycles ago, we had uh, funded uh, two code officers and I think that they were gonna have some alternating schedules that would include some weekend time. I think there was some miscommunication initially in terms of their ability to work weekends when they were hired. And I was curious as with these new hires that we've been able to make through attrition, have we been able to secure uh, code officers to be able to work each day of there so that we at least have a code officer or two on duty each day of the week? We're working with Mr. Kahili. I know that we've always had coverage on Saturday. Uh, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more uh, actually next week to talk about staff coverage. But one thing that we're looking at uh, that we're doing right now is uh, at least Monday through Saturday, as well as we're providing coverage for inspections up to about seven o'clock. We have a couple of code officers that stay past five o'clock until seven to look for. Our number one violation that we find after hours or that we're looking for is parking on unapproved surfaces as well as those that uh, kind of high priority things that are either sent from me or from our, uh, our, our leadership team that need to be addressed in a, a fairly urgent manner. Well, thank you. I appreciate those efforts, and I'd just like to, to push you and encourage you to, to look at getting this uh, seven-day-a-week coverage. I think that would be uh, phenomenal and go a long way in continuing to serve our community. Right. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Councilman Archer? Yeah, I'll just, like I said a while ago, great job in, in many different fronts, so thank you and all your staff. Um, and I'll concur with, with Councilman Noche. I drive neighborhoods quite a bit on in the evenings, and right now it's still light till you know, eight something um, Saturday evenings and on Sundays. And I see a lot of issues that need attention. So I would concur that the sooner we could get a little extra help beyond just Saturday uh, would be very positive. I think. I wanted to ask you, and, and I apologize for coming a little bit late while I go, but if you've already touched this, forgive me. But did we uh, talk about? Uh, uh, Yolanda's efforts and, and kind of uh, my specific question was how's it going in recruiting any new neighborhood leaders of recent? Sure, I believe that she's exceeded anywhere between I want to say four or five new neighborhood leads that she's identified as well as uh, her training she's seen uh, that she provided for the existing neighborhood group leaders as well as the, the new ones that are coming on board. Uh, she's provided uh, training for them at, that has resulted in those neighborhoods establishing at least a base plan. What do they want to see for their neighborhood? Uh, we've discussed that that sometimes 
you know, as far as City of Mesquite, sometimes we're not able to address all of the concerns in the neighborhood, but how do we build a more of a community, having that involvement from our residents that, that reside in those areas, as well as, uh, as city staff, how can we work together to accomplish what they want to see for their neighborhoods? And she's actually developed a number of those uh, plans for those neighborhoods. So. Um, She's been, I would say, fairly successful on her outreach, and she continues uh, to meet with neighborhood leaders and looking at how she can better uh, elevate neighborhood vitality in our community. That's wonderful. Raymond, do you think that she's beginning to have a good idea of, of where there is the greatest need or neighborhoods that are lacking uh, leaders? And in the second part of that question, uh, is are we building a strategy to be able to identify areas that are lacking any type of neighborhood leadership? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I know that in my talk, I meet with her on a weekly basis, uh, uh, sometimes more than that, where we discuss uh, various things. Um, right now, I think that there, she does have a, a number of neighborhoods that she has identified. And her first year has always kind of been assumed to do a, a community-wide assessment as far as what our neighborhood groups are. And the Neighborhood Summit was a good uh, springboard into actually getting into those neighborhoods, uh, meeting folks, and, and uh, getting some of the plans progressing along that some of those neighborhood leaders have established. Uh, now, she works very closely with our police department, with uh, uh, with our community services uh, division. And so uh, I know that she's using every avenue that she can. A lot of times it boils down to finding people that are wanting to pick up that baton and carry it. Uh, you know, not so much that it's not her not making those contacts. Sometimes it's just finding a resident that wants to, to take that leadership role. Uh, another thing that she's focusing on as part of her planning process with residents is creating a succession plan. So, um, you know, sometimes you can only do that role as far as being a neighborhood leader for a certain amount of time. And when you're in that role, you have to start thinking about not only who's there underneath your wings that, that are lifting you up, if you will, but also who's gonna take uh, that baton if it were a relay race and, and continue moving forward. So I think that she's working with police department and with existing neighborhood leads to try to find some of those leadership uh, uh, folks in the in, in each neighborhood and, and find who is willing to serve in that role. I appreciate those comments. And my, my last question, just to clarify, I know I've asked this before. I do from time to time get some residents who will voice a concern that, that they got a notice of violation and they may have gotten it Monday or Tuesday, but it was sent out Thursday or Friday. And uh, I know that they could certainly call the inspector, but have we, uh, where are we at on that? I think y'all had talked about maybe looking at some possible adjustments. Sure. So what we did was so each one of our code cases, it has a, a, a priority. It has a low through high priority. So what we've attached to each one of those uh, designations is the, the compliance date, right? Um, the, that's an automated process of whenever you select one of those, it selects, uh, for instance, uh, a normal one or a medium might be uh, seven to ten days or we err on the side of caution so it might be uh, on the ten day side if I remember correctly uh, for for notice of violations that are sent out later on in the week so Thursdays and Fridays since you know we print them uh, we rely on our print shop to print those out we give an extended um, compliance date to take an account uh, what it might take for a resident to receive that in the mail. So we've made a, a adjustment as far as our prioritization and made those adjustments to account for, again, sometimes uh, it might believe that on a Friday, we allow a 14 day uh, compliance date that's printed on the notice and that should account for any type of delay for the mail because again, that won't go out until probably, if it's printed on a Friday, it's not going out until Monday. And so that printing on the notice of those of that date, is that the new adjustment that we've made? Correct, yes okay. sir. Good. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you and great job. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, just, to, just to say also, yeah, I appreciate all your comments tonight and the improvements that have been made. It's been great. 
um, along the lines of addressing mesquite and home working throughout the year and volunteers. I just wanted to add to that. I know firefighters get involved, and even last year with the addressing mesquite Horn High School football team, uh, just a few days ago, I recruited some ROTC cadets from Horn High School to go help with a, a yard. Uh, these high schools. They have these ROTC cadets that are looking for community hours, and I think that would be a great access right there to be able to reach out to them because they're looking for areas that they can help, partnership, and with some adult supervision as well. I think it would be a great idea. We've got five of them in the area, and they're well distributed around our city, and I think it could help in a lot of different areas. So. That's a great suggestion. I'll pass that on, and, and when I meet with Yolanda tomorrow, I'll give that suggestion to her to reach you, out sir. to those uh, leaders of the ROTC programs. Thank you very much for your presentation.